Production funding for Behind the Headlines is made possible in part by the WKNO Production Fund, the WKNO Endowment Fund, and by viewers like you. Thank you. A look at crime and criminal justice in Memphis tonight on Behind the Headlines. Barnes with the Daily Memphian. Thanks for joining us. We are joined tonight by Josh Spickler, Executive Director of Just City. Josh, thanks for joining us. Thanks, Eric. Along with Harold Collins, Administrator of the Shelby County Office of Reentry. Harold, thanks for being here again. Thanks for having me. Along with Bill Drees, reporter with the Daily Memphian. Um, I, I wanted to get uh, have a conversation about crime and about criminal justice and, and wanted to get you both on um, because in various ways, you, you, you all have worked with the crime problem. And um, Harold, back to when you were in the DA's office, I think focused on, with Bill Gibbons on a special assistant uh, focused on teen crime at the Crime Commission, now Office of Reentry. And Josh, you've been you know, um, an advocate for lots of criminal justice reform um, at the jail, at all kinds of things. And, and it's been a summer, I guess we're in the fall now, but particularly in the summer, of a kind of national and local conversation about the relationship between police um, and particularly black communities. And um, that conversation happens at a time when in many cities in this country, including Memphis, crime is up. Um, in some cases up, I, I think what in Memphis, violent crime, including homicides and, viol and aggravated assaults, up 10% almost between January and June. And so, Josh, how do you, how do you look at these conversations and these, uh, whether it's the protests or it's the, 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 the defending of police um, in reconciling that with the crime problem? Where are we? What do we need to do from your point of view? Yeah, Eric, thanks. I think fundamentally that's, that question is about trust. The relationship to police officers and the community uh, communities that they police. And frankly, in this community, I think um, there's probably not a lot of disagreement uh, on, over the statement that, that that relationship is broken, that there is very little trust between the Memphis Police Department and the community that they are policing. Um, they lack transparency. They lack accountability. Uh, fortunately, this, you know, this year has been one free of major uh, issues, major police-involved shootings. Uh, but uh, I think you know, we, we've had a lot of great reporting recently from the Daily Memphian and other media outlets uh, in this community that have shown us just appalling things on camera, appalling things on paper that Memphis Police Department officers have been involved in. Uh, and it's taken journalists years to uncover that. And, um, and I think that's a, a very good example of the problem is that any sort of attempt to hold them accountable, any sort of attempt to bring transparency to that department is met with, with stiff resistance. And we have to solve that trust problem before we can talk about how to use police officers in our community to address our crime issues. I'm going to get Harold in. I'll, I'll come back to much of what we, you just touched on, but I will let both of you guys just kind of have a minute here to talk. Um, Harold, for you, when you look at this, again, former city councilman, you've been in criminal justice directly or indirectly in, in many roles. Um, that issue of policing, more police, less police, and the role of police, um, um, particularly in Black communities, how do you view that? Well, several ways. Number one is uh, the policing in the Black community or in Memphis alone has been the same way for decades. Um, you know, it's amazing to me when you got, start thinking about uh, our city and how we have evolved as a community, but the policing method uh, has remained the same. We've had numerous police directors and they have used the same uh, processes to uh, police in communities, to evaluate crime, uh, to promote their programming, um, and that has not changed. And so as we have evolved, policing has not. The other piece to this is um, when you talk about uh, more police or less police, um, what we found is and what we see is every time there is a issue, uh, the answer is more police. And so that is the 
default. And um, I think, again, because our community has begun to evolve, uh, policing has not. And so their whole thing is, uh, whatever the con concern is, uh, the answer is more police. It's not uh, looking at what the real issues are uh, because policing, we're always right. And because we're always right, then the best way to solve that, that problem in the community is to add more police. Let me, you know, I, I'll, the, I, I see it in our comment section. I see it on social media. I see it, you know, it's a, it's a, a common response and it's a, a kind of um, visceral response that people have when, when, when there are conversations about whether it's defunding the police or, you know, the police are doing things badly. People will say, and I'll stay with you for a second, Harold. Um, yeah, but who do you want to call if your house is being broken into, if, you're, um, if someone's being assaulted, if some terrible thing is happening um, in your home or, or to your family or friend, you don't want the police to be there? Is that, it, the, people hear what you say, and I think they, 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 they come to that conclusion um, often. First of all, um, I think uh, in, in more times than not, I think it is what the intent of the wording is. People uh, in my uh, circles do not want to defund the police uh, because we know how important they are. Uh, but what we see and what we talk about is uh, what other ways could have been utilized or deployed to resolve an issue. Certainly we want police to come when, we, when there's a crime that has been committed uh, and and realistically, police can't be everywhere to stop crime. But there are opportunities for our community to look at uh, what we can do uh, to prevent some crimes uh, and to shore up some of the problems uh, or concerns that our citizens have before police are in a call. Uh, for example, uh, you know, the, the police department is renowned, known for its uh, CI, C, CTI program. And many times officers who show up at scenes um, are not trained in that particular process. So then you have to call other officers from other areas to come and utilize that skill that they have trained. And so um, those are some of the things that uh, people see uh, and want to see done more in our community. It's not defunding the police, it's utilizing them in a different way. Okay, back to you, Josh, and then I'll go to Bill. Um, it, it, Josh, when, again, I think people would, I think there are people out there who would respond to what you said and say, well, but yeah, we, we at the Daily Memphis and other places have written about some, some acts that are uh, bad uh, actors within the police department. And, and I think any public official, anybody like needs to be held to account. So I stand by those stories. I think people push back though and say, the overwhelming number of police are good, hardworking, well-intentioned people. The overwhelming number of encounters between police and citizens are by the book, peaceful, do not involve violence or anything that, that or misbehavior in any way. Is that is that, do you agree with that statement? Yeah, I, I mean, obviously, most of the men and women on the police department are good people. Most of the encounters are, are good encounters. I do agree with that. What I think we're finding in, in some of this really great reporting, and, and frankly, as, a, as an attorney who's been representing people charged with crimes in this community for 20 years, I've heard a lot of stories from the people that I'm representing. Um, I can't believe them all. I can't disbelieve them all. And the, the things that I see, the themes in these interactions that we're learning about, that we've, been, we've known about for years, these so-called bad cops, these uh, incidents that do make the news, uh, there are themes and there are uh, ways of speaking to people that we're seeing in, some of, in one of these recent videos in particular that are, are very familiar to the stories that I've been hearing for 20 years, right? And there's a se segment of this community uh, that is treated um, probably more times than not uh, that way. And so I don't think it, it's wise for us to discount the idea that the entire police department represents something to a, a vast swath of our community. And I think there's evidence to back that up. Uh, and I think that we're, there's clearly, as Harold put it, a, a, an attitude in that police department that we can do no wrong, that, that account, we'll handle our own accountability, we'll handle our own problems. 
Uh, we don't need the media asking for things. We don't need advocacy groups asking us to do things differently. We don't need the community's input. We hear that all the time in the criminal legal system. We hear it from the police department. We hear it from the district attorney. Uh, and that that is no way to keep us safe. Um, and, and so, you know, I, I don't believe that all the, the entire police department is, is full of people uh, who are, are out there you know, preying on others. But I do think there's a culture of cover up. I think there's a culture of protecting uh, each other. And uh, that makes for a, a less safe city. Bill. So at, at this point, the Strickland administration is in the second phase of looking at police reforms. The first part of this, I, I, I think it's fair to say, has basically been we're already doing some of the reforms that are that are being talked about and discussed nationally. Um, Harold, fr fr from your vantage point, um, are we on the road to police reform with what's being done within the department now, or is there a, a, a more pronounced departure from that path in order? Well, first of all, Bill, let me say, um, I'm not privy to uh, what those uh, reforms that Mayor Strickland uh, and uh, Director Rollins uh, are putting forth because I'm no longer a quote unquote public servant officially. So I don't have uh, the inroads of to what they're trying to accomplish. Uh, but what I can uh, say is if any of those reforms do not include uh, more transparency, um, the ability to allow the Citizen Law Enforcement Review Board to really, really do its job, um, to uh, utilize more of their specialized training when uh, going to scenes when there is persons who have mental illness or mental disorders in play, um, then you get much of the same. Uh, I, I can say uh, to you that uh, I was sort of uh, awestruck when uh, the first proposal was we need 2,800 police officers. Uh, and, and I don't know if that was a trial balloon or not, uh, because I do remember uh, one of the reasons um, we are in this predicament with the crime rate, quote unquote, is we've lost over 400 officers for what I consider to be bad plan. And so uh, to add 800 new people uh, requires more money to pay on pensions, uh, insurance, health care, and all those things, which was the catalyst to reduce the number in the first place. So. Uh, but again, I go back to saying I'm not privy to what they're doing and um, where they stand with proposals. Mm -hmm. um, Josh, from, from, from your perspective, is the path to police reform uh, pretty much a continuation of what the police department has been doing to date? No, I don't think so, Bill. Um, I don't think so at all. I think that we need that this country or this, I'm sorry, this community uh, needs something that that looks much more like what happened in Camden, New Jersey. I mean, I think, you know, Harold talked about this solution to every problem being more police officers. And that is an investment, right? That is an investment that this community has been making for decades in the Memphis Police Department to the tune of hundreds of millions of dollars a year. Uh, and that department has developed into a modern urban police department that includes all the things that modern urban police departments include lots of officers lots of precincts lots of cars guns uh, bulletproof vests and things like that it, it looks more like a military than it does uh, a, a member an institutional member of this community and we need a police department that looks more like a member of this community it looks more like my thing for example knows the people that it polices gets out of cars um, understands the neighborhoods and, and, and the streets uh, that the, these officers are patrolling. And we're not going to get there with these reforms. We're only going to get there with something bold uh, and visionary. Uh, and I think that means that this new police director search that we're about to undergo needs to include that as, as its goal. It, to, to bring someone into this community has a bold vision for how to police in a place like Memphis, a, poli a place racked with poverty and all sorts of social ills. Uh, it's going to take something much different than a few reforms that are quote unquote already in the works. 
Harold, your, your thoughts on the search for a new a new police director. The the, the first thing that, that that occurs to me is that our first two police directors in Memphis, uh, uh, Jay Hubbard and Buddy Chapman, were civilians. Uh, every police director since that time has come from the ranks of the Memphis Police Department. Uh, your your thoughts on the search for the next police director? Um. First, I guess I would certainly try to do a national search um, because that way um, you cast a net um, and you do a sincere national search because you cast a net. And just like Josh has said, uh, we need a new vision uh, and a new way of policing in Memphis. And the only way you get that is through uh, casting a net that's outside of Memphis. And again, I go back to, um, you know, I've lived here all my life. I spent, you know, over now 35 years of service here. And over that 35 year period, all I've seen is the way policing is done today. And so to me, that hasn't worked. And so you gotta find, even if it's somebody within the ranks, uh, that person needs to be able to articulate what new policing will look like in Memphis and how that will get done, uh, utilizing uh, the current budget uh, uh, that, that's available now or possibly reducing that budget. A lot of people have moved from different areas of our community. Uh, so the population uh, in certain areas now are much less than they were in other times. So that, that particular process needs to be looked at as well. You don't need a whole lot of police in an area that doesn't have the same amount of people that it used to have at one once once before. So I, I do agree a national search, but even in the ranks, that person needs to have a new vision and a new way of policing. All right. Let me send it back to Eric at this point. Um I think again, you know the, I think there are people, and I hear from them. Um, uh, I see them again. I hear them in person. I hear them in, or as in person as you can be during COVID. I see it in the comments. I see it in feedback on our site. That um, are we asking police to be social workers? Are we asking police to solve? And I'll go to you with this, Josh. I guess first. It's like we're what they'll say is it's like we're asking them to solve the problems of poverty, of of bad family life. And we're asking them, whereas what a lot of people want is they want to be safe. They want to feel safe getting gas at the gas station. They want to feel safe in their home. And I think that's the disconnect that when, when people talk about uh, these major reforms and all the problems with police, other people are saying, I'm just afraid. I'm afraid for my child. I'm afraid for my spouse. So how do you, how do you help me reconcile that for them, Josh? Well, first, I would say it's not easy. Like this is not an easy solution. If it was, we would have found it. Um, and I think we need to start asking ourselves. We have to. We just. We have to rethink the whole thing. I mean, I think re reimagining policing is a great, you know, a great phrase because that's what we need to do. We need to stop thinking about police in the way that we've always thought about them. Why does a person with a gun uh, show up on the side of the road, right? If you're broken down, why does a person with a gun show up when your loved one is in a mental health crisis? Um, why does a person with a gun show up when a, an unsheltered person downtown uh, is, is frightening someone? Um, th this idea that there's a, an almost military response to so many of our social ills is the problem. And, and, it, and we are asking police, Eric, to do all of those things. They're at the tip of our social sphere, and it's impossible. It's an impossible job. I have police officer friends. We've all talked to them, and we understand as well as we can. Uh, what it takes to be a police officer, and it is not fair. It's not fair of us as a community to ask them to do that. So, um, but but I think we need to to divest ourselves of this idea that people with guns need to be responding to all these problems, and invest in ideas like social work, like community-based mental health care. Uh, you know, the, the the police service technicians are a great re response to that, right? Sending someone without a gun to handle traffic problems. That's a great idea. Let's blow that up and take it into other areas like mental health and, um, and other places in this community where police are currently carrying that load. That's the kind of thinking we have to do. And that's the kind of leadership we need in the new police director is one that will be willing to do that. 
to you, Harold, um, a kind of variation on that question. You know, the 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 Amy Wyrick, district attorney uh, for Shelby County, wrote a column for us this past week, focused on juvenile crime and how we deal with juvenile crime. And you've been involved with juvenile crime, and points out that there were um, last year, I think this was 2019, 830 major violent crimes committed by juveniles, um, including aggravated robbery, rape, and murder. Um, people are so afraid, right or wrong. They're very afraid. And so when I think they hear you talking about all this change, they feel like, well, that's just going to take us backwards. And that's a reason to be more afraid, not less afraid. But address that concern that I think people have with what you and Josh are saying. I don't think that people uh, would feel afraid, uh, particularly with the juvenile assessment center that uh, District Attorney Wire uh, uh, presented. I mean, that was probably, that was uh, a part of the Operation Safe Community Plan um, that I worked on when I was a member of the Crime Commission staff. Uh, it was designed to um, lessen the, the touch of, an in, of a juvenile once they came, became involved with police if they committed a crime. That, to me, triggers um, the social works or the social workings that go along with life in our community. Um, and I, I go back to what Josh said about uh, um, uh, um, policing. Uh, people want to feel safe because all they know is the crime that occurs in their community. But the crime for me is a byproduct of what's missing in the community. The crime occurs because as a young person, I don't have someone that I can talk to about my concerns and issues because there's nobody there but my high school basketball coach or football coach. Um, as a father, I can't talk to my children, one, because the court has ordered me to stay away from them because of juvenile court issues. Um, as a mother, I don't know how to talk to my teenage boy or teenage son when he's going through puberty and all of these other things that are happening in his, in his life, because I can't relate to him as a woman and talking to a young male. I mean, all of these things are byproducts of the community we live in. Live in. What I submit to you is, and Josh is right, it is hard, but it takes courage as a leader to present a plan to address that as well as a, a plan to address the crime. And that's where the rubber meets the road. When you spend 68% of your budget, six, let's make it clear, so we, we, our budget is nearly $700 million and we spend 68% of that to protect ourselves between police and fire. There are no opportunities to address these other mishaps uh, that go on in our community and the pandemic has pulled that Band-Aid off to expose what we're dealing with. And when there's no, no, no courage to present those kinds of plans, this is what we have. Uh, just a couple minutes, I've got to build. All right, um, Harold, in, in your position with the Office of, of Reentry, what can you say about the current state of the Memphis Police Department, good, bad, or indifferent, no matter what your opinion is about it and how that impacts things down the road in the criminal justice system, such as people coming out of prison and re-entering society here in Memphis. Well, here at the Office of Reentry, we are uh, rebuilding <laughs> uh, the men and women when we get them. And that means really rebuilding them, uh, sharing with them the real truths about their actions and getting them to understand that um, they have to take personal responsibility for themselves. And then secondly, once we get them through that, and that, that also includes mental health counseling, personal counseling, financial literacy issues, uh, child support. But once we do that, then we encourage them to say, what is it that you enjoy doing that you wanna continue doing? And let's put you on a path to that, whether it be welding, small engine repair, uh, uh, HVAC, whatever the case may be, because we have opportunities to help get you to that destination. 
but it's not going to be easy. You're going to have to work at it. You're going to have to persevere. You may have some pitfalls, but the pitfalls are there to train you to be persistent. Um, with that, we, we train or encourage our, our clients when they come into our building to understand that the police is not your enemy and you shouldn't treat them as your adversary, even though you spent a considerable amount of time serving or being convicted of a crime. They're only there to do their job. And if you understand that, then you'll be better off as an individual and a productive citizen in our community. Just 30 seconds here. I mean, thoughts yeah. on I mean, repeat offenders and that cycle, which is such a big part of the violent crime problem. Yeah, it's very difficult to break that cycle. The, uh, the, the long tail of building up and investing in a criminal justice infrastructure the way we have for decades in this community is exactly what Harold and the good people at the Office of Reentry are dealing with. It is uh, generations of people. It is, it is hundreds, it is tens of thousands of people coming through their doors. Uh, and we have a disaster on the scale of the Titanic when it comes to getting people out and getting them back to work and getting them uh, to, to not reoffend. And we're sending Harold and his folks in a canoe to do that. We're not investing in the things that work. We're, we're investing in the things that create the problem in the first place. On that ever so cheery note, uh, we will end it because that is the all the time we have this week. Uh, remember, you can get past episodes on the show on the WKNO website at WKNO.org, or you can download the full podcast of the show from the Daily Memphian site or wherever you get your podcasts. Thanks, and we'll see you next week.